All right, peace and blessings, and welcome to another episode of the Author Spotlight Self Publishing 30 Days podcast. I am your host, Rob YB Youngblood, president of sales for Self Publishing 30 Days, and I have the pleasure of being with another one of my Alpha brothers, Dr. J. Elisha Burke. And uh, prior to the, to the conversation, we uh, had a discussion uh, regarding names and the importance of being able to say someone's name properly. So Brother Burke, thank you so much for gracing us with your presence. Uh, please, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and where are you from originally? All right. Good morning. Uh, wow, that's a lot. Anyway, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be here to share for just a little bit about what this life has been about. I am originally from a little place called Belvedere, North Carolina, in Coquimans County. It is, I'll say it's the North Carolina side of the Dismal Swamp. So it's, you know, so when you go beyond Chesapeake or beyond Suffolk, mm -hmm. you're getting into my territory. So I started there and then I went undergraduate degree for it at Elizabeth City State University, which is only about 30 miles from where I grew up. Yeah, I was so gonna I ask to you that. Me. I was gonna ask you that. So when you start talking about going beyond Suffolk and in and, and that part of North Carolina, the first thing I think about is Elizabeth City uh, State yeah. University, so which is also HBCU for those who are listening. Most people, when they listen to this, they know I got a lot of folks from HBCUs that uh, that join me here on this show. So so right. proud of that. So so what what prompted you to you know transition? Because you're currently in Richmond, Virginia, correct? Right. I'm currently in Richmond, Virginia. After by the time I was in my senior year at Elizabeth City, I had. I had two job offers. One was in Williamsburg and one was in Florida okay. as a teacher. So I came to Williamsburg after graduation as a social studies teacher. Mm -hmm. And that began this evolution into where I am now. You know, that was in the 70s. Yeah, so yeah. More than a minute ago. I hear you. I hear you. And so, so you went from teaching social studies and now you're in a realm where you're focusing on you know, you're a nonprofit director, so you're doing some things in a nonprofit realm, you're doing things in ministry. Talk a little bit about, you know, where you are today, and then I'd love to learn a little bit more about your book. Okay, well, my, my bet, I always, always knew that the teacher in me would, would override everything else. Mm -hmm. So I trained as a teacher, but I changed in social studies and history, so I was a social sciences major. Okay. So even as a teacher, I was looking for opportunities to serve in the social sector. So even while teaching, I was a big brother and all those things, I always had to do the outreach things. Yeah. So when I came to Richmond, I accepted a position here. At that point, I, I, had, I found out I needed to really deal with who I really was. So I tried going into businesses and you know, I, I, worked, I was one of the first African-American accountants at two, organiz two businesses in Richmond. And so, but I realized something was missing in that piece of, of serving. Mm -hmm. And that whole piece of and and teaching while serving, so that's why the nonprofit sector became such a pull. And as I became more active in the church, for me, being active in church meant not so much not only what you did on Sunday, Wednesday, or whenever, right. but it, it's that that had to connect with the people in the community. Mm -hmm. I'm a child of the civil rights. I was born in the '50s and grew up in the '50s and '60s. And I grew up in a segregated environment. I was, the school I went to wasn't fully integrated until our senior year. Right. So I've, I've lived that reality of the so-called separate but equal. So and I lived in a community where the church was at the center of getting those messages across mm -hmm. that we must take a stand, that we must not accept this. So that's all in me too. So, yeah. so, that, so the, the foray into social justice just was natural for me. So, and so that's why I wound up at, you know, some point saying if I, the church is the place, I've got to deal with this call that's on my life, but it's not the call that says, just go and just be in a pulpit. Right. And I called my, in my head, it said, I need, I need to find a way to make my ministry look like what I saw in Jesus. Yeah. I saw someone with a particular message, but instead of just waiting for people to come to him, he went to the people. That's right. And de demonstrated to them by the way he taught, by the way he treated them initially, mm -hmm. and then also by what he taught them. Yeah. This was different, that there is a different way to be. And so that's, so I often said I modeled my ministry after the idea that you show people as much as you tell people. Yeah. 
Yeah, I love that. I love that because you you know you know as you know as you know I went to a Baptist uh, oriented in institution here in Richmond, Virginia Union, and oftentimes you hear people being called into the ministry. But you said something so so uh, uh, profound, and that is just because you received the call doesn't mean that you need to be in the pulpit. So there's other ways, uh, other parts of ministry that allows you to, to operate in your call, uh, but it may not be from, from the pulpit perspective. Would, would you agree to that? I absolutely agree to that. But you know, at the time that I was called, I was, I was very young. I just, I, just, I just ran away from it for 20 years. Oh. And part of that was because of growing up in the rural, all that scene of preachers was that you, you preach and then you go and get a church and that's all you do. That's basically. Right. That's you might right. get a job to support yourself if, if your church couldn't, but I didn't see that. I couldn't, I, didn't, I never felt that. So one of the things about our school, cause like I said, I did two degrees at our school. Yeah. But the first time they were training pastors, everybody in the school of theology was being, basically being trained to be a pastor. Mm -hmm. So myself and those that really felt more drawn to a Christian education and mm -hmm. social ministry, mm -hmm. we had we had we learned the classic things that pastors learn, which is important. Right. Because I did wind up pastoring, but but um, but but we were able to craft and to shape our particular ministry mm -hmm. so that it fit out what what God was doing in us. So yeah. I pre I'll always appreciate that. Yeah. And like I said, I've been called back to speak to a number of classes over the years yes. about other options for ministry. Yeah. yeah. So for me, it was as a Christian educator and as a nonprofit director. Mm -hmm. In my master's project, the pastor and I created a nonprofit organization, which by the time I finished seminary, it became my full time vocation. Yeah at the church along with you know still doing some christian education that's but that's amazing i ran a nonprofit full time that did a myriad of services in the, in the inner city yeah that's amazing I, and i know you from obviously from alpha but you've done a lot with men's ministry as well can you talk a little bit about and, that and still do and still mm -hmm. do the uh, organization we started is the open jackson family life skills center which is not existing now mm -hmm. but i existed for 17 years so but anyway, we, I started with men's ministry as a part of my work in, in, as a Christian educator, mm -hmm. because the men's ministry there was not geared towards ministry. You know, men in churches often get used as the repair people, the yard yeah. clean up. Mm -hmm. But my understanding was that all of us are called to spread this gospel. Right. And all of us are part of the process of making disciples. Well, if we're gonna do that, then we have to be discipled. And so I said the men's ministry should be a part of that. And then and now most uh, pastors don't pay much attention to the men's ministry. Right. We got a few that do, and where where they do, the men's ministry tends to flourish. Mm -hmm. Flourish. So I became involved. Men's ministry became part of my charge as a Christian educator. Mm -hmm. So I started going to the meetings, and I saw that it was just the same few people that came, and they weren't didn't have any zeal or excitement. Yeah. So in those meetings, I said, let us introduce some things that can help them understand their potential right. as Christians who happen to be males. So we started tailoring some things. So that's where I started first bringing in the health aspect for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I started bringing in professionals. I got them to working with the children in our after school programming and summer programming, things nobody would ask them to do. Yeah. We had a Boy Scouts troop. I asked them to help the Boy Scouts raise money with the car washes. So I got them engaged with young people. At one point, I got them engaged with uh, this project with that, that started when I was a deacon, mm -hmm. where we, with kids that don't have a father in the house, mother's busy working, can't go to school when they get in trouble, can't go and talk about their grades, that mm -hmm. we would volunteer to do that right. with the parents' permission. So I got some of them involved in that. So we went from that to all sorts of programming that involved men. We did job training eventually through the nonprofit. Yeah. We also helped some young men get uh, themselves together when they got behind on child support, mm -hmm. we got money and we, we created a job training bank. We, we did we did all that, get them reconnected to jobs. Yeah. And we even went to court with some of them to help them establish custody, mm -hmm. reestablish custody. I am so proud right now there is there are some there's a child in college mm -hmm. whose father was in our program. Wow. And we went, I went to court with them several times to get custody. My 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 another one was had been in trouble, had been in jail, he was coming out. He was convinced he could never get his life back on track. Yeah. But it was 20 something years ago. Then this young man has turned it around. 
is on a, has, has a has a position that's very secure. Mm -hmm. Married a woman he was having the babies with, and now he's pastoring somewhere in Virginia. Mm. I never call his name. I would, that's for him to tell. Yeah, that. for him to tell. Yep, yep. I'm saying so. You there are there are things that come. Let me go on and on. So I am convinced that intervening when males before they get in trouble is critical. Yeah. And being with them, what if should they become in trouble, to guide them through the process is worthwhile. Yeah. My challenge still at then and now is to get it really happening in more of our congregations. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So let's talk a little bit about your book. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and give us the name of it and what, what prompted you to, to write your book. Right. Okay, the book is Faith Beyond the Pews and Experience in Social Action Ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's a sort of, it's on my life. I started I talk a little bit about how I started, how I was introduced to faith. And also then I talk about my faith formation, which I sort of just talked about in terms of finding out and going to, and, and in school being blessed to have professors that got, got what I was saying, mm -hmm. that supported me in that journey. And then being in a church where the pastor had, had, had been pastoring for years before mm -hmm. he came to our church. Right. But he got it. He had the same kind of vision for the church and community. So uh, the book, like I said, the book is, is a long time coming. Because yeah. I, I, it really, I based it on my doctoral work, okay. which was completed in 2004. Mm -hmm. And I kept putting it off. I got busy with the nonprofit and other things yeah. and so many other things that I've done. So I sort of chronicled that particular journey, beginning with my rural existence, you know, the early things. I mean, if, if people don't believe that you can start off with little, very little except faith and and a parents, a faithful parent and another one that wasn't quite so faithful, right. they have a strong work ethic, yeah. that, that God can do amazing things with us. So like I said, I started out very poor. Mm. You know, I've worked the field. I was telling somebody this morning, I picked cotton. So mm. and people, young people look at you like, oh, you should be dead by now. But it's, not <laughs> far back. <laughs> but it's not as far back as you might think. Right. So I'm, but, but at the same time, I had the blessing of being, being in a family that has, our family name is on two churches in that area, mm. Methodist Church and the, and the Baptist church, and that's my mother's side of family. Right. And so, they, so, so we always had a strong faith foundation, and that was with me. So that sustained me through the difficult times, and going. Um, I'm, my, I push HBCUs all the time mm -hmm. because I learned in that segregated school that I got something that I wish our kids could get now. I got support. Mm. all day long from people who believe as we believe yeah and also who believed in what black people could do yeah in the midst of segregation and all the other things that had happened so they they were a constant encouragement so i had that encouragement then i went to an hbcu where they continued the same thing yeah High expectations you weren't getting away with anything right right but you were being told that you truly are able to do better you truly are worthy of all the things that God has put on this earth. So yeah. that's what I brought with me everywhere. I've brought with me everywhere I've been. Yeah. So yeah. saw a lot of things where I grew up. I had a strong support at home, but make no mistake. I refer to it often in private as in that color purple world that I grew up in. Yeah. It wasn't in my house so much, but it was mm -hmm. all around us. Right. So I see possibility in, in all the young, in the people that all those look at and say they're no good, mm -hmm. they're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody from that family is going to do this. Well, you know, in in my family, generation before me, they didn't get to high school. Right. So, so I just believe in the possibility in every person with the right support. No, I love I love your story and your, your testimony is so powerful. You even you even touched on the, one of the biggest challenges that prevented you from you know, putting your book together because you said you you completed your your your, your dissertation, your thesis work uh, in uh, 2004, which which is a which is a, actually a great great year because that's when I finished college. It took me it took me eight yeah. years to finish a four year degree, yeah. but that's another story. Yeah. Uh, but it definitely required faith. But 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 you talk about the faith component to even put this thing yeah. together. What what would you say was the biggest outside of just the time that it took you to put this book together, what would you say is the biggest challenge or hurdle 
that you needed to overcome before you began to do this work in terms of your book? Like, what, what would you say is that one big challenge that you had to overcome before this book became a reality for you? The big challenge was, was, was that I always, always had, um, I had challenges of health mm -hmm. and I had commitment to family. Mm -hmm. So all during this process, uh, as, as I, I was telling my nephew the other day, mm -hmm. I said, don't wait, don't think you can do everything in a straight line. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I don't, I really very rarely, I don't know what it really would be like to have one job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Remember that everything I've done, I've done while I had other jobs. Yeah, you have multiple things going on. I had a full-time job while I, while, I, while I was starting a nonprofit and yeah. going to seminary. Yeah. A full-time job when I was doing, uh, at a church when I was working on my doctorate. Right. So by the time I came out of all of that and really, I was just totally burned out in 2004. Right. And I sort of got back on track in 2006, started getting back on track when I left the church mm -hmm. and, and became full-time with the Baptist General Convention. Okay. Which has, of course, the ministries here have grown. I came to do one ministry and now I have four. So, yeah. You know yeah. I'm saying? But that was gradual. So I was making that adjustment, but I was also healing from all those years of, of, of 50 and 60 hour weeks and just pushing it and I, and I always had health concerns. That's another thing I talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever your concern is, God is able. Yeah. There was a ministry in you, God will work it. If you're willing to, to be used and molded and shaped, mm. if you're willing to suffer a little bit because you believe there's something greater coming, yes. it can happen. It can happen. But I've never had to, I've not had the luxury of having having so-called good health. Yeah. But I always have had enough to do what was required. What needed to be done. Yeah, I, I like that. That'll preach, that'll preach every single day. So I, I, I and I appreciate that because yeah. we also talked about this prior to jumping on the importance of being able to teach people who are ready to be taught, not just on a Sunday, right? So yeah. so so in your book, what would you say are the are the I guess the biggest lessons that a reader would take away from the book? Like why? Number one, who who is the book for and why should someone pick it up? All right. The book is for, for all of those that, that are looking at ministry and not seeing a place for themselves. Come on. They, they know God has said, go, go preach my gospel and all that. And but they're still saying, and what? You know, because they see things all around them that need to be dealt with from sun between Sundays. Yeah. And if, if that call on you says there's something I've got to deal with, I can help people with that, making a living, uh, keeping their children. And we did those types of programming too. So yeah. then, then this is for that person that's wondering if I'm not from a family of preachers, so to speak, and is this not for me? Yeah. Or most, perhaps most importantly, does my personality fit with what is in my mind about a preacher? Right. Because you know, you know, you know, brother Young, look, I don't fit the outgoing, gregarious. Oh, mo hey, listen, I, every everywhere I go, if I when I open my mouth, the first thing they ask me is, "Are you a preacher?" Because they know I'm outgoing. Yeah. I like to talk right. to people. I'm very gregarious, so that's the first right. thing they ask me: right. "Are you? Are you?" Are you a preacher? Like, are you in the ministry? And I, I used to struggle with that question, mm -hmm. uh, brother Burt, because I'm a Christian. I, I believe in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But I knew that if I said that I was in the ministry, they was going to ask me to come and preach. And I'm yeah. like, no, yeah. I'm not. You're not catching me. You're not going to label yeah. me a jack leg uh, preacher. It's just not going to happen. Even though I went to Virginia yeah. Union and there's yeah. a whole lot of dudes out there. Yeah. They know how to hoop and holler. They know how to talk that good, that good talk. Yeah. They not. Yeah. They don't have no yeah. license. So then some people will say, well, I've been licensed by God. Right. I'm like, okay, cool. That's what's up. But yeah. when it come down to the federal government and they, they want to know why you collect and payment like this is this your profession mm -hmm. so so yeah. so i i i i get that 100 and i love the fact that you have a niched uh target because at the end of the day you know people write books for obviously everybody could say this book is for everybody right mm -hmm. but i know personally people who may be in the midst of struggle because they know they have a call on their life but mm -hmm. they don't see what that call is because they don't see anybody doing it. And so because they don't see anybody doing it, they're like, okay, is this really real? And so I'm 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 certain, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that your mm. book addresses that, correct? Yeah, it's a validation for those that don't see themselves in the traditional 
yeah. modality of what ministry looks like for them. And yeah. also for those who, who come from backgrounds that are not ideal, yeah. or maybe they've had a lot of people that didn't have faith in them. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I'm, I'm the bookish, quiet person. They didn't see me as being a teacher. Yeah. You know, people were saying things to me in my senior year. How are you going to teach? You don't talk. You don't talk. You yeah. Know? Because I'm I'm not I've never been shy, right? You know what? But I do have but I do have social anxiety. Okay. And I think I'm one of the first males that started talking about that reality mm. that they're there. We got to deal with ourselves because left up to me, I'd stay in my house. Yeah, yeah. No, I no I, the, the ministry doesn't allow that. Yeah, <laughs> no. But you know what? Even even as you're talking, brother Burke, I first of all from outside of just the interview, just the personal interaction, right? I now understand what I didn't understand before. You do carry you do carry a demeanor, right? There's a certain demeanor that can be misunderstood because it's like, man, why, like, why, why is he looking like, like, you know, is he upset with me? It's not that he's upset. It don't got nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with what's going on inside of you. Like, okay, I don't, I don't feel comfortable in this space, but I'm challenging myself to do that. And I appreciate the fact that you're not only uh, are you sharing that, but you're helping other people, especially men, because, you know, men have been taught, oh, be a man, be bold, be strong, don't be weak. Right. But when you deal with anxiety, that's a form, that's a form of, of, of weakness at that time that you have to make adjustments for. And it doesn't mean that that's a bad thing. That just means, hey, I'm dealing with something that I've never I've never dealt with before. Right. So I, I appreciate your your trans your transparency. And you carefully work with it, you know, and like I said, I, and the blessing along the way is I've had some mentors. So I do mentor some people also one-on-one yeah. -on -one because yeah. I had that the people that they saw the potential. In fact, I had someone, one of our one of our fraternity brothers actually. Yeah. He said he started pulling me out of church so much. He said, You were here all the time, you're here every day of the week. Yeah. You can take some Sundays off. So he would drag me out to the church, whatever churches he was serving. Yeah. He was determined to pull me out. So, but the thing is, so so there is that for those looking at what their ministry can look like. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about men. Yeah. Most of the requests I get to share about this are from men. Mm. Because they they see they see in it some possibilities that nobody ever pointed out to them yeah because like i said you know pastors pastor women more intensely than they do men men are sort of mentioned like father's day and men's day right women are encouraged all the time men all the don't time get the yeah. encouragement yeah so i think they, they felt in this that they're they hear some practical things i can do and here's somebody who overcame some of the same stuff I've had to deal with. Yeah. And so I think we we understand that. I think I think this ministry and particularly this book mm -hmm. helps people understand that our 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 understanding of God must not be so heaven heavenward. Yeah. That we don't want to don't deal with our earthly reality. That's right. That That's we, right. We are here with and for people. Yeah, I love it. So the ministry is in those day-to-day -day acts of kindness, those day-to-day -day -day things that mo most people wouldn't think to do or say for somebody, you do those things. Yeah. And then trusting your intuition, which is for those, those, those of us with, with faith know that sometimes that's just God nudging you mm -hmm. to do that thing that is yours to do. Yeah, yeah. So, so I think, I say, so and it's a, um, I'm I'm glad it's been used at a class at the seminary. Yeah. Other, I've been asked to teach from it at Evan Smith Institute and other places. So it's just getting out there. A lot of the promotion of it got cut off because of the pandemic. Yeah, because of the pandemic. But you know, the beautiful thing about what you've got going on, obviously, so there there there's some theology classes, there's some seminaries that's teaching it. So that's another lane. Obviously, you've got a specific niche, but you've got a lane where people, uh, men in particular, uh, those that are in ministry can get hold of this. Uh, yeah. As we as we begin to land the plane, uh, Brother Berg, talk about how can people connect with you to get their copy of your, of their book? Because because there, there's going to be some people that's listening to this. They're going to say, man, that's some interesting stuff. I had never really thought about it. I want to get my hands mm -hmm. on a copy of the book. How can, how can uh, direct them to how they can get a copy of your book? It's available on Amazon.com, mm -hmm. Faith Beyond the Fuse. 
and experience in social action ministry. I always have copies with me wherever I go, but, but the easiest way, if you, especially if you already use Amazon is through Amazon, it'll get to you in a day or two. Yeah. But um, again, I encourage people that as you're taking classes, whatever you're studying, do one that deals with social justice. Mm -hmm. Now, most schools will have a type of one or two classes deal with that whole thing because it's not, the need for that is not going away. Yeah. And so whatever your ministry bent is, your connection with people will be one that 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 that's like Jesus. They, they they relate based on you relating with them. Right. Be willing to be among people, even if you're an introvert. Yeah, I love it. No, that's the listen, that's a mic drop right there. So as we as we close out, um, you know, you mentioned where we can find the book. So I do have a curveball for you. And I ask this question on each one of my on one of my shows that I interview folks. So uh, I'm sure you'll be able to come through on it, uh, Brother Burke. So let's say down the line, you choose to write your next book. And and let's say you, you have the opportunity to travel anywhere in the world. And I was paying for it. Let's say I was cutting a check and I was going to send you anywhere in the world to write your next book. Where would you travel to? Where would you go? I would go to Nigeria. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of my newest programs here at the convention is called Sacred Spaces. Okay, yeah. Looking at the history of our churches, and you can't really do the history of the church without doing the history of the people. Come on. And doing the genealogy of the people. So now that I know I'm, I'm, I'm like 93% African, with 50%, 56% of that being Nigeria, mm -hmm. I want to tell my story, a more intimate story of myself beginning with Nigeria. I love it. Keep working on up. I love it. No, I love that. I've actually had one other person mention Nigeria. I had another alpha brother. He said, just drop me anywhere in Africa. I don't care mm -hmm. where it is. Just drop me off. Uh, and and, and I'll, I'll navigate from there. Well, Brother Burke, thank you so much. Once again, please tell us the name of your book. And uh, and uh, once again, tell us how can they find your, your your book as well. All right. Name of the book is Faith Beyond the Pews, an experience in social action ministry. It's available on Amazon.com. Oh, excellent. Well, listen, you all have heard Dr. J. Elisha Burke, and I'm so glad that I had this opportunity to connect with you for multiple reasons. Number one, because we love uh, to support authors and their desire to increase the visibility of, uh, and credibility and profitability of their work, but also because on a personal nature, I've got a chance to get to know you better. So thank you so much for gracing us thank with you. your presence. For those of you who are watching, listening, remember, this is the year for your new book. As you continue to, to overcome your challenge, just know that like Brother Burke did, you can overcome them, whether it's anxiety, whether it's time, whether it's family, whatever it is, you can overcome them and we are here to support you. But as you go through the process, be encouraged, be blessed, but most of all, continue to share the faith. We used to say, keep the faith, Brother Burke, but yeah, I'm telling people to yeah, share yeah, the faith yeah, yeah. because you share the, your, you share the faith by walking in your gift uh, because your gift will make room for you. We'll see you in the next really? episode. All right, God bless you and thank Blessings you. Blessings to you.